What do you see up on the screen? A ladder. That was pretty easy. Can you think of a story in the Bible that has to do with a ladder? That's exactly what I was thinking, too. When you think of Jacob's ladder, we know what Jacob, we know the, the situation, we know what Jacob was thinking. He had set the, the stones down for his pillow, and he slept that night, and he had a dream. And he saw a ladder descending down from heaven. This is important. Saw a ladder descending down from heaven. And he saw the angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder. And when he saw that, when he woke up the next day, he said, Surely this is the house of God, and this is none other than the gates of heaven. So he took the stone that he had for his pillows, he poured oil on it, and he called that the name of that place what? Bethel. Bethel. So what's interesting is, you, I've mentioned this before, but if you look over in John, I think it's in chapter 1, He's being introduced now to some of the guys that's going to end up being his disciples, Philip and Nathaniel. And they're asking about Jesus. Did he come out of Galilee? Does anything good come out of Galilee? And Jesus tells them that from here on out, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So we know that Jesus was all throughout the Old Testament. Amen. But he wasn't called Jesus. He was the, the, the stone that, he, that Jacob laid his head on was one of them. He was that stone, that pillar, the anointing. When you pour oil on something, the Hebrew word for that is Mashiach. It means anointed. The Greek word is Christos, means Christ. And so that stone was Jesus. Well, guess what? That ladder was Jesus. So that's telling us that the way to get from here... To where heaven is, there's only one way. And that is Jesus Christ. Amen? So, secret societies, different branches of the occult will take those same symbols. And they'll turn it into something that it was never intended to be. So they, Freemasonry has... The symbolism of a ladder. In fact, there's a book you can find at Google Books called The Freemason's Ladder. And it's a free download. It was written back in the 1800s. And it does what a lot of Masonic books does. It sort of gives you what they say is their secret, but they're never going to tell you what that secret is. And it's not written in any of those books. Trust me, I read them. But that symbol of the ladder to a Freemason or let's say an odd fellow or somebody in in any kind of organization like that, even if it's like a, a, a satanic cult or a witch's coven, they will tell you that it represents the levels that a person must attain to in order for them to make it all the way up to heaven. Now, when Jesus saved me, he didn't save me in degrees. He didn't save me in little pieces. He didn't save me a little bit and then a little bit more later and I'm still waiting for the rest of it. When Jesus saved me, I was saved. If I would have died that night, I would have gone to heaven. If I would have died 20 years ago, I would have gone to heaven. If I would if I would have died when I got electrocuted, I would have gone to heaven. If I would die tonight, I would be the same way. There's no steps or levels when it comes to Christianity. Somebody say amen. Now, we, we grow and we mature and we can learn more. But when you're saved, you're saved. So think about God's plan, instant salvation, versus the devil's plan. And I, I mentioned this the other day. A guy that I, I don't mention his name anymore because I don't trust him. I don't follow him. He's turned wholeheartedly Hebrew roots. But at one time, he was sort of in the limelight of evangelical Christianity. And he said that he came out of the occult and he wrote a book about his life. And he said that it didn't matter what it was. If it was something occult related, he joined it. He got initiated into it. I mean, he knew he was in, at one time, he was a Freemason and a Mormon and a wizard all at the same time. And he said, no matter how high I got up in whatever I was in, when I got there, I always found out there was something else that I didn't know. 
that I had to be initiated into. And so he said, so I did that. And then he, when he got there, he found out there was levels and layers above him that he had to also be initiated. Is no what he's the more he went, the higher he went the more he found out it was going to take for him to finally get what he was looking for, which was illumination. He mentioned something about, he mentioned the philosopher's stone, he mentioned the holy grail, and he said the holy grail is different depending on what branch of the occult you're in, and no matter what you're in, you're always looking for the holy grail. You're always looking for immortality, you're looking for divine illumination, you're looking for that pinnacle of being at the top. And when it comes to the devil, there is no top. You're always climbing and you're never achieving anything. That's what, that's what the Bible says. Always learning, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So ponder that ladder for a minute. And I want you to think about where our culture is in this country now versus where it was. Let's go back 70 years. Did people 70 years ago dress like people dress today? Not even close. When people went to baseball games, they put on a suit and tie and put on their Sunday finest. Okay? Seventy years ago, did grown adults use foul, vulgar language in front of little children? No. Seventy years ago, did they have sodomite weddings? Seventy years ago, did women go out dressed in an immoral fashion or men? No, it just didn't happen. What, how did we get there? Did we change overnight? It happened in stages, didn't it? Think about that ladder. Think about this. Step pyramids. They're all over the world. Now, how did this one religious idea get all over the world? Well, I've always said there's two religions. Bible Christianity, witchcraft. Witchcraft is all about levels and stages and climbing the ladder or climbing the pyramid. This is down in Mexico. It's Chichen Itza. And I'll show you something about this here in a little bit. But it basically represents levels and stages that people have to go in as far as their religion. The, by the way, these, I think these are the high places mentioned in the Old Testament. This is where they did. This is where they met their God. Their God was up here, they were down here, and they had to meet their God by climbing these ladders or going up these steps or being initiated into these levels and so on. So think about what I have here. Now down on the bottom, you've got a guy listening, one of those ear horns. Sterling, aren't you glad you don't have to carry one of those around? He wears hearing aids. And then Edison invented the phonograph, right? And the people were able to listen to music Music now could be listened to in some other place than symphony orchestra or the, the music hall or whatever. You could take music with you or speech and listen to it. Then the phonograph. Then the CD. Then the, I still have an iPod. Way back then. What's next? I have a question mark after that. How are people going to be listening to music 10 years from now? I think probably some people know in this world, and they just haven't told us yet. But we do know eventually where all this is headed, don't we? Eventually, they're going to take all these electronics, put them in the skin rather than outside. So instead of young people walking around with their earbuds in all the time, now they will have them playing non-stop, 24 hours a day. And is music different now than it was 70 years ago? Oh, yeah. Did, do they say things now in music that they didn't say 70 years ago? Absolutely. And how did we get there? Stages. Okay? So think about, well, the electronic communication. Telegraph. There was a telephone down at the general store, if you watch Green Acres, right? Then people had a telephone in their house, and then I was a holdout. I didn't want a cell phone. Now I don't want to go anywhere without it. Don't you, do you do this when you leave the house? You go, oh, I left, I left my phone. Like there's no phones anywhere anymore. 
And then we find, we're the Jetson age. Now we have these video calls we can make, right? In fact, my daughter, call, when she calls me, she calls FaceTime. She don't call phone anymore, she calls FaceTime. Where's that headed next? Will we have the ability in 10 years, maybe? David, you're the expert here. 10 years time, do you think people will be receiving messages intracranially? Five years, you think? Okay, could be. Tesla, we know Elon Musk is working on it. Sure. Okay, he's already developed this neural net. It's, we're getting there. Think of, think of this, what's on the back of our dollar bill. We have the all-seeing eye here. That's the pinnacle of illumination. But it seems like nobody ever gets there. They're always climbing the ladder, always going up in stages. This is what we were taught in school, that this is where man came from, right? Man's progressing this way. We were little chimpanzees a million years ago, and somebody decided to strike two rocks together and fire came out. Now everybody's doing it for somehow that rewrote man's DNA. I don't figure that out, but anyway, that's what they say. That we have gone through stages already and we've evolved. And now we're kind of stuck, but we're going to evolve again. Only this time, everybody's agreeing. Man's not going to wait for the evolution to happen. He's going to create it himself. He's going to make that evolution happen. We're going in stages. This is what everybody believes. But remember, when you got saved, did God save all of you all at once? Yes, he did. He didn't go in stages. So we know this is not how God works. This is not how he does things. Now turn to Isaiah 14. I misdirected you. Look at what Lucifer's doing. And, I mean, who is Lucifer? We know he's the devil. But could not these verses also point toward mankind if we are if Christ is in us and we are in Christ then we are the body of Christ right yes. okay so flip that upside down and think of the world Lucifer is their God they are in him he is in them and so what it says of Lucifer, we know that we're joint heirs with Jesus. So what God promises to Jesus, he's promising to us. Look at it this way concerning Lucifer. And think about mankind and how mankind is going. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? And look at what he said. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. And notice, uh, I've made a point about there being five things here. But all five of these, he's constantly going up another level I will ascend into heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will be now the last thing he says what is he like the who most high is there anything above him no he's most high so even in his nature the way he thinks the way he perceives things this is why in his religion it's easy to spot it. They'll tell you, you must go in stages. Uh, some folks here came out of the, I guess, charismatic movement. Um, I've had people tell me that they were told the reason why they're not speaking in tongues and the reason why we're, they're not manifesting certain things is they're not on that level yet. Is that something you ever heard before? Oh, yeah. yeah, you're not on the same level as us. When you get up to our level, then these things will occur naturally. But there are no levels. The disciples at Pentecost didn't have levels, did they? They spoke in tongues, right? So this is the devil. This is how he is. But then it says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So we know what goes up. And that's exactly how it's going to happen. But it's always about stages. So remember what I just said here. This is Lucifer. The dragon, Satan, and they're back at... Oh, I wish you would quit doing that. They're at Chichen Itza. Every June 21st, summer solstice, the way they designed this pyramid 
is that the sun shines, I guess at noon, and it hits the shades or the, the sides of this pyramid here. And the shadow draws out a serpent right there on the side. And it's descending down here for summer solstice. It's coming down from heaven. And then winter solstice, I think it goes back. It looks like it's going back up to heaven. That's the devil. That's his religion. That's, and they, they marked it by drawing him out that way. Think about the Saturn V rocket. This is the rocket that sent the guys on Apollo 11 to the moon. Now, this part right here, where I got that red dot, that's where the astronauts were. All of that whole rocket was just to get this little bitty thing up to the moon and back. And how did it go? They decided early on that they would do it in stages. So this was the first stage. And when it got 100,000, 200,000 feet up in the air, all the fuel was spent out of this, so it fell off. So now this rocket kicks in. That rocket gets them higher. And then this rocket kicked in. That got them higher. Then they used this part to propel themselves to the moon and come back again. All about... In fact, while I'm looking at this, turn to uh, Obadiah. I knew I was going to chase rabbits tonight. Obadiah chapter 1. What was it that landed on the, on the moon? The eagle, right? So look at verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, then will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Well, we didn't just get to the moon overnight, did we? There was Apollo 1, which never lifted off. That killed the th three astronauts inside. There's your sacrifice there. And then Apollo 7, Apollo 8, Apollo 9 were tiny trips to the earth. It was, I think, around Apollo 10 that they finally got to the moon and came back and Apollo 11 landed on the moon. So they didn't even get there, just build a ship and go there and turn around and come back. They did it in stages. You follow me so far? Think about Freemasonry, secret societies. When you enter in, you're down here. They don't tell you anything. You have to go through levels and stages and learn secret handshakes and code words and so on. By the way, this represents over here, this is the York Rite. And over here is the Scottish Rite. Two different branches of Masonry. And what's interesting is the York Rite has 13 levels from beginning to the top level. The Scottish Rite, of course, has 33 levels. I don't know. If, me, I'd want the quick way. I'd join the York Rite. 13 steps instead of 33. That just sounds better for me. 46 total. You think that's an accident? I don't think it's an accident. Think about UFOs and aliens. Some of you are going, ah, that's a bunch of hooey. Well, they put it in the newspaper. The army released this story that they captured a flying saucer. They then, the next day, said, uh, no, no, we got to cover that up. So they come up with a different story. That was 1947. Project Blue Book. The Air Force is taking in all these stories about people seeing UFOs and aliens and flying saucers everywhere. And they come out and say there's nothing to see here and move on. But then people keep seeing them. People start having interactions with things that they don't know what they are. They call them aliens. We might as well just call them devils because that's exactly what they are. So Whitley Strieber, when he wrote his book Communion, and he put the picture of that alien on the front cover, all of a sudden there was an explosion. People started going, I've had these experiences. I've seen that. It triggered them. So now there's a mass awareness now that something's going on. So then, a few years ago, the Pentagon released. It wasn't leaked. It wasn't somebody snuck out information. The Pentagon helped the New York Times write a story 
that the Pentagon had spent $22 million in the last several years to investigate military encounters with unidentified flying objects. So why did the Pentagon all of a sudden, after all these years, 1947, all these years of silence, why did they release finally a story that says, yes, we're looking into this, we have been. We're taking it serious. And by the way, here's actual videos that our guys in our planes a billion dollar piece of technology captured on video these little flying things that were doing things that we don't know what they are, where they come from. Why did they do that? Because just last week, same New York Times reports classified Pentagon hearings on crashed recovered UFOs. And they're calling them off-world vehicles not made on this earth. The Pentagon now has said we had them and they didn't come from here. That just came out this week. Wow. Starting out in 1947, covering the whole thing up and said, we don't, we don't, what, UFOs? What, flying saucers? Crazy people see those. Our guys don't see those. But now they're saying, we not only see them, we have some. But then the next day, the New York Times retracted what it said. Backed up and said, oh, we didn't mean to say that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. It's like, did you hear the leaked story about Joe Biden's pick for vice president? What was it? Who was it? Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. Kabbalah Harris, whatever her name is. <laughs> and then they come out and said, well, that we didn't mean to. That that's not really true. Oh, yeah, it was. They wanted that leaked out because that's the way they test the waters. See how people are going to react on this. But what we have now is our government has said, or a branch of our government has said, yeah, we have stuff that we know for a fact did not come from this world. They just admitted it. Everything's in stages. So what do you think's next? Okay. Remember 9-11. Who, who remembers 9-11? Everybody remembers 9-11. You remember where you were on that day, right? Now, where were you this time three weeks ago? And what were you doing and what were you talking about? You don't have a clue, do you? But you remember where you were on September 11th, 2001, what you were doing. See, it impacted you, didn't it? This is how things work in this world. Okay, so all of a sudden now, is our whole li was our whole life affected by 9-11? Yes. We even, we even changed laws in this country because of 9-11. Um, COVID. Have we changed laws now because of COVID? By the way, you're in Jefferson County, not St. Louis County. If you don't want to wear a mask, you don't have to. Okay. Antifa. You think all this is happening just as an accident? It is. It is progression. All of these things change how the world works and how people see the world around them and how people see people next to them, how people see God, how people see everything. It changes, but it always does it in stages. Look, uh, Genesis 11. Now you can go back to there. And let's look at what they were doing. The whole earth was of one language and one speech. And I, I'm one of these, I believe that the world was all one landmass at that time. So they were all together, one landmass, one earth, the whole earth. One language, one speech, and they were all one people. Okay? And it's going to change. And it came to pass, they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto where? Heaven. Where did Lucifer say he wanted to go? I shall ascend into heaven. Heaven. 
So it's everybody's wanting to go there. They just don't want to do it God's way. See the point? Because God's way, what, what's going to happen in the rapture? Are we getting translated in stages? No, boom! All at once, boom! We hear that, now we're there. Amen. Okay? And it won't take long either. Blinking of an eye, and that's it. But this, they're all, and what we know they built was a ziggurat. Not a cigarette. A ziggurat. Stages. Let's get there in stages. Let's get there in levels. Okay? Go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. We, that's what we read in Obadiah. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou build thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So what did God do here? They're building their way up to heaven. What did God do? I'm going to put a stop to this. And they all came back down and dropped their bricks because they couldn't speak to one another. God confused them. Okay, and that's what the number 11 means. It's confusion. Disorder. Chaos. I don't know. I don't... I can't think clearly. That's what... Drunkenness. Think of all these themes in the Bible where people can't see or they don't know or they can't walk straight or they can't stand up because they're drunk or they're out of their mind, they're crazy or they're a lunatic or something's wrong with their thinking process. That's what Genesis 11, that's what the number 11 represents. Whole earth was of one language, one speech. And so what God do? Verse 7, let us go to, let us go down and there confound their language. Confound it. That they may not understand one another's speech. So what happened? People started dividing up. The people who were speaking this language, Spanish, they're over here. The people who were speaking Sumerian, they're over here. The people who are speaking uh, Hebrew, they're over here. They're meeting up based upon their languages. Then they divide up further by families and tribes. Then in the days of Peleg, God split the earth in half and divided them all up and said, stay away from each other. God divided the nations, did he not? Amen. I mean, let's, let's be honest. I mean, this is a mixed crowd here. We have white folk, we have brown folk, we have black folk. Do we not like being around our own kind of people? It's not racism. It's just that's how God designed us. Do we not like being around people who speak English? If you're in a foreign country, I guarantee you, you hear somebody speaking English, you're going, where are you from? Yeah, you want to get with them. You, that, and that's how God designed all this, to separate everybody out. So they don't get back together as one and try this again. But what's man doing now? Exactly that. So verse 9, therefore is the name of it called Babel. Babel. And it sounds like that. Because the Lord there did confound the language of all the earth. And then I put it, I threw this verse in here, Revelation 17, 5. Part of forehead was a name written. Mystery what? Babel is Babylon. But notice her first name. Mystery. That means you can search until you die and you'll never find it. Ever. You're always going to be learning. You're always going to be trying to think it. You're always going to be searching. Here, Jesus made it simple. Ask and it shall be? Seek and ye shall knock and it shall be? It's that simple. I, I don't know who did this, but whoever sent me that picture, I love it. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Amen. Jeremiah 30, notice the number, 33. 33 is the number for wisdom in the Bible. But it has a dual meaning. Wisdom comes from Christ. How old was he? 33. And yet, if it's 3 times 11, if it's based upon the number 11, then it's a confused wisdom. Wow. A lot of people think they know. Bill Nye, the science idiot guy. Stupid. Okay? He thinks he knows stuff. And he, he did a video the other day where he put one of them silly masks on and he pretended that he couldn't blow a candle out. And then some lady put a ma same mask on and went, blew the candle out. He's trying to make us think that that mask will protect us from the virus. And it's fine. 
Okay? But notice her name is Mystery. Babylon. Mystery. If you're not, if you're not going to get it from the Bible, then you'll never really know it. Amen? Uh, turn to Revelation 9 if you want to very quickly, but notice there's an event going to happen in prophecy. Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounds, the fifth trumpet sounds, a star falls from heaven. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. He opens the pit, smoke of a, as of a great furnace comes out, and probably going to talk about that tomorrow, comes out, and all of a sudden, here's these devils come flying out of there. They're not attack helicopters, like what's his name wrote in late great planet Earth. They're not helicopters, they're devils. And notice that there's 11 things that defined them. The shape of the locusts like on the horses prepared in the battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as women. Boy, that's confusion right there. Somebody who has transgendered themselves, do you think they think straight? They can't figure out who they're going to be. That's confusion. And God said, don't do it. Didn't he? Right. God said, don't do it. It's confusion is what he said. And God meant those words. He didn't just say it's nasty. He didn't say it's disgusting. He didn't say, you know, you're not really pulling it off. I can tell you're a guy. Uh, by the way, I heard Sports Illustrated, their swimsuit issue, they were going to have a, a tranny. Well, you should have cut your uh, subscription off a long time ago. Okay. Their teeth were as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates of breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like in the scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And then, number 11, they had a king over them. Who is that? I think it is. I think it's the Antichrist. I think it's the man of sin, the son of perdition. He's got all these names, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is a bat. Notice, God's telling us his name. Hebrew tongue is a bat, but the Greek tongue had this name, Apollo. Apollyon is Apollo. So why did they name, why did Apollo 11 land on the moon? Why did it ascend into heaven? as an eagle building its nest among the stars. Think about it, okay? Ah, uh, I gotta bring this guy up. Huh? Todd? Todd, yeah, Todd Bentley. He calls himself a part of Joel's army. Joel's mighty army. This is the mighty army of God that's gonna take over the world Put down all the kingdoms of the earth and give them to Jesus so he can return. Oh boy. And I, I thought I was missing something years ago. I'm going, Joel's army, is, are we supposed to be Joel's army? So I went and started checking it out. And when you compare Joel 1 to Revelation 9, the locust, uh-oh, what did I do? The locust, horses, horses. Like the noise of chariots, like the noise of chariots. They're a strong nation who have the teeth of lion. They have the teeth of lions. Joel's army is devils. But you know what they, the, the other title they refer to themselves as? The new breed. That's genetics. The new breed. A new generation. A new army that's going to be supermen that's going to take over the earth for Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, hybrids is right. The word confound is in your King James Bible 55 times. It's 11 times 5. Wow. This Bible's right. Amen? Amen? So look at the verses. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to what? Confusion that devise my hurt. Do you think there are devils out to hurt you? Oh, yeah. But what's God going to do to them? You think there's people out to hurt you? God's going to bring them to confusion. Let them be confounded, Psalm 71, and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. 
Psalm 97, 7, Confounded be all they that serve graven images. Catholics, any religion, Lutherans, um, do they have? Do the Lutheran churches up in Minnesota have images in them? Um, yeah, the churches down here are Missouri Synod, and the the only one that I've ever been to had a big ten foot Jesus statue on the stage, and the priest coming in reading a prayer to it, and I'm going, I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to do that. You see, he read the Bible, but he didn't see it. He didn't believe it. He didn't understand it. He was confounded and confused, even though it's the same Bible. He didn't understand that he's not supposed to be reading prayers to a big Jesus statue up on the stage. He's confounded. He's confused. God has a spirit of confusion. And it is a spirit. Amen? Amen. Jeremiah 10, look at this. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. By the way, the word brutish is 11 times in the King James Bible. And that word means beast-like. You ever seen a dog go? What does that mean, John? You don't know, really? Oh, it means I don't know. Okay, I get it. It means I don't know. I don't understand. Dogs can't fathom certain things that we all take for granted. They don't get it. They don't understand. Uh, while we're there, turn to Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. So think about what happens the false prophet has got to convince everybody in the world to make an image of the beast. And he's going to succeed in it. God's going to let him have his way with everybody's minds. They're going to do it. I think they're working on it now. For his molten image is falsehood and there's no breath in them. Breath is spirit. There's no life in it at all. It's dead. And God said, is, God, is he the God of the dead? No, he's the God of the living. So Daniel 4, here's Nebuchadnezzar, that Nebuchadnezzar has another dream, and he says in, um, oh, let's see, let's pick it up, verse 16, let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. And remember, I I've taught this before, but our belief in Jesus is not just in the the calculations of our brain that we added it all up and we think Jesus is the right God. We actually believe it in our heart, don't we? Amen. And see, that's the difference. That's what happens to people. I mean, Catholic priests are some of the best educated clergymen in the world. I mean, they have to go to school for seminary for years, seven or eight years, something like that. Many of them are doctors and physicists and, I mean, they're, they're very well-educated people. But they're dumb as a box of rocks when it comes to knowing God. Because they still fall down in front of a statue and think that that's God. Or they still have that cookie there on the stage that they think literally becomes the real flesh of Jesus Christ. And you taste it and you're going, they don't taste like meat. He's like a dull cracker. There's something wrong with their thinking. They're confounded. They're confused. They have a spirit of confusion. They are brutish, beast-like in their understanding. So a beast heart was given to Nebuchadnezzar. And he was out in the backyard of the palace for seven years eating grass, lapping up water out of a puddle or a dog bowl or something didn't even know his own name for seven years you couldn't talk to him he couldn't talk back and he had as much understanding as a dog or a kitty cat when it came to what men can understand and God did that to him and I believe God's going to do that to everybody else yeah. their heart is going to be changed over to a beast's heart. You believe that? Amen. 
God's going to confound them. Jeremiah, look at the numbers here. 22, 22. The wind shall lead up all thy pastors. Has that happened? Where's all the pastors? Where's all the churches that used to believe the Bible? The wind ate them up. And thy lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then thou shalt thou be ashamed and confounded. Watch this. Uh-oh. What is it that brings confusion to our lives? Wickedness. Is this Bible right? Amen. All the pastors having secret sins going on that nobody, that they hope nobody finds out about, hope nobody knows about. And they're confounded, they're confused, and they get up and preach, or they read their sermons that they printed off the internet, or whatever it is. But they don't understand zip out of the Bible, and don't want to. Somebody was asking me, I, I mean, I, Pastor, I don't understand why all these guys don't figure this out. Sin. God's turned them over to a reprobate mind, some of them. Maybe there's hope for some. I hope there is. I believe there is. There is hope for me. And there's probably some other guys God's going to call out. But because of their own wickedness, they're all going to be turned over. I mean, okay, let's go back 70 years. 70 years, would a church ever thought of having two guys in front of the church kiss and be wed in front of everybody? We would have never done that, never thought of it. So how did that happen? It didn't happen overnight, did it? Stages. All of a sudden now, they're a different way, and they don't think nothing of it, don't know how they got that way, and don't care. It's all done subtly. You ever see, have you ever seen the moon move? No. I mean, you can go out at 9 o'clock and then go out at 11 o'clock and see that it has moved. But nobody's ever went, I'm seeing it move. That's really... If you do, you're a whole lot better at it than I am. Because I've never seen it move. But we know it does, right? Amen. But it does it so slowly, so gradually. We don't comprehend it. But then all of a sudden, now it's different. It's in a different place. And this is what's going on in our world right now. We didn't just get this way overnight. Okay? Jeremiah 50, verse 2, Declare ye among the nations, and publish, and set up a standard. Publish, and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken. Bell. Who's Bell? Baal. Baal. The, the Old Testament name of the Antichrist. Bell is confused. He's confounded. Remember those 11 things that the devils are like in Revelation 9? And the 11th thing is actually in verse 11. I didn't point that out, but it's in verse 11. Who their king is. Abaddon. Apollyon. Okay? Merodach is broken in pieces. Scattered all over the place. Her idols are confounded. Her images are broken in pieces. Jeremiah 51, 17. Every man is brutish. By, and remember that word's 55 times in the Bible. By his knowledge, every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood. There's no breath in him. That's a double. We saw that in Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah 51, 47. Therefore, behold, the days come that I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon. Babel. Like little babies. Or people speaking in tongues. And her whole land shall be confounded, and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. There's your falling right there. All of these things are going to happen again, and they're happening right now. If you ask me what part of the Bible read to find out what's going on in the world, start Genesis and move your way forward. It's there. Micah 3, 7, Then shall the seers be ashamed. Who are the seers? I want to talk about this tomorrow. I want to talk about divination. Fortune telling. Things that people are prophesying. Then the seers shall be ashamed and the diviners confound. Is anybody, by the way, does anybody know what divination is? Matthew, since you raise your hand. Now you got to answer. Everybody's looking at you. Look at my son Matthew back there. Put him on the spot. 
Yeah. I was actually telling him in my office a little bit about what's going to, what you're going to find out tomorrow, but I'm not going to tell you tonight. Think about, I will tell you this, think about all the kings in, all the, in the Old Testament. All the princes, all the rulers. Did they make decisions all by themselves? They had counselors, didn't they? And almost without fail, all of their counselors were stargazers, astrologers, magicians, divination experts. So how did they counsel their, their lord, their king? They would stargaze. They would cast lots. They would look at the liver, the Bible says. They'd look at tea leaves. They would look at... And they shall all cover their lips, for there's no answer of God. Listen to this. There's no answer of God. God won't talk to them. What happened to Saul? What did he turn to? And if you, say that, if you still say that was Samuel, I saw something today might change your mind. It wasn't Samuel. Wasn't Samuel. Okay? He had turned to divination, and a woman pulled up a familiar spirit who posed as Samuel. And you can say, well, Samuel told him what was going to happen, and it all happened. Did it? Did it? We'll find out. Okay? But I was thinking about this idea of all the kings in the Old Testament. They all had occult arts practitioners telling them what was going to happen. Now, knowing what we know about this Bible, that the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be, ask yourself the question, is it possible that there are people in our government who are predicting future events by occult means? Guarantee it. And see, I don't have to know all the CIA documents. I know the Bible. And the Bible tells me everything I need to know about what's going on. Isaiah 28. Look at verse 11. God put it there for a reason. He said, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Moses was a stammerer. Stutterer. He was hard of speech. And he asked, God, you can't send me. You got, so he said, okay, I'll send Aaron with you. But the reason, there's a reason why God made him that way. It's because when the Jews read Moses, they understand it about as good as Moses spoke it. Which means not very much at all. And I've read enough Kabbalah literature to, to tell you that the Jews' knowledge and understanding of the Old Testament is almost none at all. They'd be better off not having an Old Testament rather than reading it and believing what they believe about it the way they do right now. And when God said, I'm going to turn you over, he turned them over big time. In fact, the Kabbalah, as far as a never-ending religion that you never figure out, that's Kabbalah. Almost all rolled up into one religion. That's Kabbalah. God said with stammering lips, Moses, and another tongue. New Testament, Greek, not Hebrew. Will I speak to this people? Why? To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. God would have given them rest had they accepted Jesus right then. But that, they wouldn't do it. So, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear but the word was, of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The Jews' problem is that they have here a little, but they don't have there a little. They don't have the New Testament. So they can't put the pieces together. It's like getting a 500-piece puzzle and only having 250 pieces. You'll never figure that out. You'll never get the picture, ever. And, and this was and Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, what were they doing? They were speaking Egyptian. They were speaking, there's a list of 17 languages there, none of them Hebrew. They were speaking to the Gentiles. And all the Jews were going, I don't understand this. What, what are they doing? Their own Messiah was up on the cross saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And they had no idea what he was saying. They were saying, oh, he's calling to Elijah. 
That's what they thought. But were they right? No. He was quoting Psalm what? 23. 22. 2 times 11. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they didn't understand that it was the Messiah there. They didn't, they didn't know and put the scriptures in place how in Psalm 22 they would pierce his hands and feet. How they would part his garments among them, cast lots for his vesture. How they would mock him and, and, and criticize him. It was all right there in Psalm 22. And they didn't get it. They were confused. So remember what Paul said tongues were. In fact, turn to, uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 14. Let's look in some of those verses. Paul said tongues were for a sign. I like this. The word language, 33 times in the Old Testament. The word tongue, 33 times in the New Testament. Wow. That's 66. Yeah, it is. And remember, remember this. You have 32 teeth and one tongue. What is that? 33. And Jesus is the mouth of the Lord. He's the word of God. Amen. Wow. And when you have two witnesses, that's 66. I love this stuff. I kind of settled down a little bit. 1 Corinthians 14, 11. Look at that verse. Look at verse 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Now, I've had, I had a pastor here a few years ago, and I love him. I mean, no disrespect to him at all, but I sincerely disagree. He was a Pentecostal preacher. They all use the King James Bible. And when it came to the gifts of the Spirit, they did according to Scripture. I encountered that in, when I was in Kenya. Some very well-meaning pastors asked me some questions about some things I said about tongues. And God, as I'm answering them, God's telling me, Mike, don't, don't go after them. Don't chew them out. So there are some people that have followed our ministry before that they like our stand on the King James. They like the things we're saying, but they speak a tongue. And they do it according to scripture in order. Not a bunch of women going blah, 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 all over the place. OK. I don't agree with that. And my biggest thing about that is you don't know what you're saying. And to me, the Holy Ghost is what gives us light and understanding, not confusion. Amen. Not confusion. And Paul said it in, in verse 11, it's there for a reason. If he speaks to me and I don't know what he's saying, he's a barbarian. And I'm a barbarian to him if I speak and he doesn't understand me. So verse 21, in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips. Well, I speaking to this people and that's Paul quoting Isaiah 28 verse 11. Yet for all that, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. So look at what he says in verse 22, which is either the number for wisdom or revelation or confusion. Depends. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. And who was it on the day of Pentecost that didn't believe? The Jews. Tongues and the Gentile tongues they were saying. They were not speaking angelic unknown languages. They were speaking human languages that everybody understood. And it was a sign to the Jews. God is saying, I'm done with you for now. If you won't come to my wedding, I'll invite those people in the highways and byways and the hedges. And I will compel them to come. And they will come. A people that I never knew and they never knew me will come to me. And they will be my people and I will be their God. But you, I'm going to turn you over to confusion for a couple thousand years. But for me, it's only a couple days, so I won't have to wait long. But that's what God did. And that's what he's doing now. But one of these days, they're going to see him. Amen. They're going to see him as he is. You believe that? Say amen. amen. Don't go against Israel with me. That don't, that don't go too well with me. But anyway, he said, but to them that believe not, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. And then he said in verse 33, God is not the author of confusion. 
So now it makes sense to me. I'm reading my Bible and I'm, I, I believe what God said. Mike, the King James is right all the time. And when God started putting the pieces of the puzzle together for me, when I started seeing the language structure, the King James, how don't change any word at all. Don't even add a, le a letter S or take a letter S away. Don't, don't do anything. Don't just leave it the way it is. Believe it. And my wife stayed that way the whole time. I'm the one that left and came back. And she was there waiting on me. Amen. God is not the author of confusion. Amen. Amen. So that's why I don't believe that we speak some sort of unknown language that we have no idea what we said and nobody else knows, but God knows what it is. I don't think that that edifies. I don't think that that's the Holy Spirit. And by the way, when it comes to what angels say, I can point to you every place in the Bible where there's angels talking and you know exactly what they said. Every time you know what they said. Deuteronomy 28, 49. Here's the angels that don't speak what people understand. Deuteronomy 28, 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. All these people that say that they've had contact with aliens... They said that they spoke something, but I didn't know. I couldn't understand what, what they were saying. And I've read hundreds of accounts, and they're all saying the same thing. Writing or symbols on the craft that they're flying, and nobody knows the letters. Nobody knows the meaning of the symbols. They don't know what they are. They don't understand the language. Isaiah 28, we've... Talked about that. Jeremiah 5.15 Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. That's two witnesses now. God's told us that when these things come, they will speak. And he doesn't say a language you don't know, but you can learn later. You'll never know it. You'll never know what they're saying. Think about... Squirrels. Do squirrels make sounds? <laughs> right? What did I just say? I'm nuts. <laughs> okay? That's what I just said. Dogs. They bark. They make sounds. Cats make sounds. Lions make sounds. Dolphins make sounds. Whales make sounds. Science studied whale sounds for years, and they believe that they're speaking to one another. And scientists have tried desperately to find out what it is the meaning of their language. They have no idea, do they? We don't speak beast. You get it? We don't speak beast. We never understand their language. And that's what these devils are that are coming. They're beasts. These locusts that are going to come up out of the pit, do locusts make sounds? Yeah. Rub their legs together and make sounds, and, but we don't understand the language. That's how it's going to happen. It's going to be a world full of confusion. Think about um, the, India, the religion they have, Hinduism. You know what their version of heaven is? Perfect nothing. Perfect nothing. I'm looking at Trisha's going, she did what my dog did. I don't understand that. That makes sense, does it, Trish? We read Book of Revelation about heaven. Heaven's everything. Amen? I'm not going to the place of perfect nothing. That's a confused place. That's, you know what that is? Job 10, a place where there is no order. That's exactly what that is. That's the place they're going. Um, 
Let me move through some things here. I'm look, looking at the number 11, like in Genesis 37, when Joseph had his dream about the sun, moon, and the 11, he noticed he said the 11 stars. And he said, they're all bowing to me. And of course, that enraged his family, right? But in Genesis 42, Joseph standing right in front of them, but they knew him not. And you know who Joseph is, don't you? He's Jesus. And you know who his brothers are. He's still his brothers. It's the people of Israel. And Jesus, their brother, was right in front of them. He knew them, but they didn't know him. Now, quiz time. When Joseph was sold by his brothers, how old was he? I'm here and going 33, 42. Hike! He was 17. So how old was he when, let me get this right, how old was he when they got him out of prison and he told Pharaoh's dreams? How old was he then? Huh? He was 30. He was 30. Hang with me. So he prophesied the two dreams, right? How many years of good? Seven. How many years of famine? Seven. So he's 30 years old. Taken when he was 17. So how much is that? From 17 to 30, how much is that? It's thir 13 years, okay. So now he's 30. Now you have the seven years of plenty. So now how old is he? 37. And then how many years into the famine? Two years. Two years into the famine. Now how old is Joseph? Subtract 17 from 39. 22. So after 22 years, he finally says, it is I, Joseph. It's a, isn't that something? See, 22 is the number for Revelation. Book of Revelation has 22 chapters. Yeah. Isn't that cool? That's cool. And see, he's 39. He's the law. The lawgiver. 39 books in the Old Testament, right? That's good. So that's, I mean, think about the order. When God says, you know, God is not the author of confusion, he put everything in such perfect order. Amen. You ever used to watch that show, Monk, about the guy that didn't like to touch stuff and if things weren't lined do you remember that show Jesus outdoes monk by a whole universe because everything is in perfect straight lines amen? amen and God likes it that way but how did he make the serpent crooked, crooked as a dog's hind leg and that's something hey, and just think about it one of these days, Jesus is going to appear and the Jews whom he has chosen is going to go, oh, that's Jesus, the Messiah, the veil of Moses. And they're going to see his face shining as the sun and they're going to know who he is. And they're going to know the same Jesus that we've been knowing all these years. Amen. Think of the 11 disciples. Once Judas hung himself. Now you've only got 11 disciples, right? Then the 11 disciples, look at how the Bible puts it. The 11 disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some what? Doubted. Why? Because there's only 11. They're in confusion. They're not sure. Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. They're in confusion. They, they're not sure. That's what that number always tells you. And returned, Luke 24, 9, and to return from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven. But look what it says. Their words seemed to them as idols' tales, and they believed them not. Well, is it eleven the number for confusion? Yeah, it is. 
Jeremiah 51, 7. Oh, here we go. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth, what? Drunken. You think the earth is going to get drunk again? Oh, yeah. Big time. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. And the word mad is 22 times in the King James Bible. 11 times 2. And mad doesn't mean angry. It means crazy, out of your mind. 1 Corinthians 14. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are what? See, this is why you're not to do that in the house of God. Because people will think, these people are crazy. And I watched, there's a guy that, you know, Sid Roth and his it's Supernatural show, right? And anybody that's on Sid Roth's show, they're out of their mind. They're reprobate. And this guy was a... I guess a Southern Baptist pastor had a big Southern Baptist church in northern Georgia, and all of a sudden, he got the gift. And he said that while he was preaching, he looked over in his baptistry, and his baptistry, like ours right now, was empty, but he said he could see water in it, and it was the Holy Ghost. And he said he could see a strip in the water that was about this wide and about as long as the baptistry is long, and it was on fire. And he said, God told him that from now on, anybody he baptizes in there is going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And I want to talk about that tomorrow. So now he's got a big, huge, wingding following going. You've got people coming from all over the world to get in his baptistry so they can be out of their mind crazy. And that's what happens to him. Because he now speaks in tongues. And he's got books now to where he's saying, if you, if you speak in tongues like he speaks in tongues, well, it cures your cancer. It helps your back feel better. You'll, yeah, everything, you'll get money. I mean, it's all this nonsense about you must speak in tongues in order to get these things. And you're going to get baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire if you get in his baptistry. He's running another little uh, Pensacola outpouring is what he's doing. Or Toronto blessing. It's all about getting a drunk spirit. Are you here? Are you with me? Amen. You didn't come down here to go home to go to bed. Some of you want to get in a pool at the hotel or what? Come on. First Corinthians 4. I've already read that verse. Maybe I need to get it together. Second Thessalonians 2. Turn there. What's God going to do? What is God going to do with the whole world? With all deceivableness of unrighteousness. See, there it is again. What confuses us? Sin. Sin, sin, sin. Your sin. And them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. And think about that phrase. You have a love for the truth, right? Right? Amen. But you didn't make it yourself. You received it. Because it was a gift that God offered to you. And you said, I want that more than anything. I said that. I want that more than anything. Okay? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So God offers that gift of the love of truth. But people don't want it. And for those that don't want it, God has developed Babylon, who he says is a golden cup in the Lord's hand to make the nations of the earth drunk. And what's in that cup? Fornication, the blood of the saints and the martyrs. Blood, remember what we said Sunday night, blood makes her drunk. What's in the blood? Know where I'm going, Dave? Okay. And, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Somebody sent me an email the other day, and they said, will you help me uh, answer a, a member of our church's questions? And it was a paper full of why they believe the earth is flat. And I wrote him back and I said, I give you my two cents worth, but the bottom line is they don't believe this with their head. They believe it with their heart. And if it's believed with their heart, only God can change that. Because my experience is once they believe the earth's flat, 
you can't talk them out of it. There's no talking them out of it. They think that way, and they don't believe there's any satellites. They don't believe that, yeah, n none of that stuff exists. And I said it vi what I said was it violates the Bible because the Bible says that the sun rises and goes down, clearly. And I can see that happening every day, right? But their sun spins parallel to the flat surface of the earth, never goes down and never comes up. But they believe it does. They believe that that's what you're seeing, that it's just too far away and it's beyond your line of sight. That's what makes it look like it's going down. And I'm going, no, that's stupid. <laughs> but you see, I've tried to explain that to people. And they go, <laughs> and listen, to me, the flat earth thing is like the silliest delusion in the whole world. When God sends a strong one, they're not going to make it. And I've, I had a good friend that I lost to that kind of thinking. And now they're worse from what I hear. They're worse now than they were over different issues. And when God sends that strong delusion, there's no stopping it. You're either, if you're in, you're in. If you're out, there's no going in. That they should believe a lie. That they all might be. And that's in verse 11. Isn't that something? That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure. And see, there it is, unrighteousness again. Sin and confusion, they go together, don't they? God said in Ezekiel 14, they've got idols in their heart. And because of that, I'm only going to answer them according to the abundance of their idols. Their stumbling blocks. So if they ask me of anything, I'm only going to let them believe a lie anyway because they don't want to hear the truth. They turned me off a long time ago. So all they're ever going to hear is lies, and they're going to believe those. The, words, the phrase strong drink in your Bible is 22 times. But is that for revelation? In vino veritas? You know what that means? In wine is truth. Because some people, when they get drunk, they just spill the beans about everything, right? Okay. But no, it's confusion. And think about it. Do not drink wine or strong drink. Now they're nice sons with you. When you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die, it should be a statute forever throughout your generations. And that you may put difference between, un between holy and unholy. Look at what he said. If you're drunk, it's, if it's holy, you won't know the difference between holy and unholy. So, two guys coming in this church, walking down the aisle, kissing in this church, we're going to go, no, that ain't going to happen. Right? And you better tell God, thank you for not turning you over to a reprobate mind, because he could have. Every one of us, he could have. And that between unclean and clean, you won't be able to see the spots on the lamb that you bring in or that somebody brings in. Because you're drunk, you won't know the difference between, what, four things? Holy, unholy, unclean, and clean. See it? When you're drunk, you don't know the gospel. A young man that used to preach in this church has now gone over. He's all Sabbath keeping, law keeping. We keep the feast days. We follow the law. I'm going, no, you don't. You're just telling yourself, or you let your mother-in-law tell you that. You're just telling yourself. You're making yourself believe it. But that's not how, that's not the gospel. Amen? That's not the gospel. Look what he said in Deuteronomy. You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that you might know that I am the Lord your God. What happens when you drink? You don't know who God is. Why, by the way, we're having communion Sunday here. And Rose was going to order the stuff. And she said, now they make it to where they put the, the wine and the bread all in one little thing, like a snack pack. I said, nah, because I don't know if they're going to give us wine or not. Isn't it sad that some young boy or girl's first taste of alcoholic wine was in their church? Communion. Ours is clean. 
Amen. New wine. Amen. Amen. Not that old stuff. Why do you let around sit around rot for? Amen. Amen. Look what he said. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. See how he puts it? Strong drink, 22 times. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law. Pervert judgment. Don't you think that's what's going on in Jefferson City and Minneapolis and Washington, D.C. and what's the capital of Ohio? Columbus. Columbus. Don't you think that's what's going on there, Will? You got too many drunkards in the halls of Congress wearing judges' robes? Absolutely, they're drunks, perverts. Yep. And their name's fixing to come out in the paper. Because Monday, they're going to release the 14 hour deposition from Ghislaine Maxwell. That's you, you think she will? We'll see. Find out if it's been 33 days since she's been arrested or not. We'll find out. Isaiah 5, 11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tabret and the pipe and wine are in their feasts. That sounds like their church services. But they regard not the work of the Lord. They have drunken revelries in the church, but they don't know the Bible. Uh, let's see, I already read that. Am I done? No. Let me move. Oh, here we go. Micah 2, verse 11. Look at that verse. If a man walking in the spirit of falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. Look at that verse. That's Rodney Howard Brown up there. They call him the Holy Ghost bartender. Because when he comes to the church, Brian, he just starts talking and lays hands on people. And all of a sudden, everybody starts laughing like they're drunk uncontrollably shaking, quivering, having body reflexes that they can't control. And some of this lasts for days. And so these people are devil infested with wine. It's a, but it's a different wine, isn't it? It's a spirit that's in them. And it's inflamed them. <laughs> Let me have that chair. Woo!
Aren't you glad God didn't turn you over? Amen. He could have. The word wine, 231 times, 33 times 7 in the Bible. Isn't that neat? Wow. New wine, 22 times. Wow. And look at Joel 1, 5. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. God took this away from them and gave them that. Haggai 1.11, I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle, upon all the labor of the hand. A drought of new wine. And that's what we're seeing in this world right now. A drought of new wine. Isaiah 65.8, new wine is found in the cluster. So that's telling you it's not been perverted. It's not been fermented. Leaven has not entered into it. Numbers 13, 23. Remember when they came back from spying out the land? It was two guys carrying back one cluster of grapes, right? Now, to me, that's neat. That's an awfully big cluster. But I look beyond that at the symbolism. The two men are the two witnesses. The Old and New Testament bringing in the new wine of the Word of God to God's people. Isn't that beautiful? And then, John 15, I am the true vine. Isn't that what we want? The true vine. And my father's husbandman, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. There he connects it all together. Proverbs 3, 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with what? New wine. New wine. Amen. What does he say? Don't be wise in your own eyes. Get the new wine. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. God will give you new wine. And that's what my soul... You remember I told that story. I went over to this Pentecostal church over here looking for God. The one service I went to, they laid hands on me twice. I didn't pass out. I didn't start barking. I didn't fall down with a group of men. Thank God. But I left out of there as hungry as I was when I went in. And I said, God, I will never do this again. But where are you? And he was waiting here the whole time. Amen. Mark 2, 22. Look at that verse. No man putteth new wine into what? Old, Old bottles. So that's why you got to be saved first. Else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and wine is spilled, the bottles will be marred, but new wine must be put into new bottles. And on Acts, in Acts chapter 2, verse 13, on the day of Pentecost, they said these men are full of new wine. They were right! They were right! The word mystery, 22 times in the Bible. It's almost 9 o'clock, but the first occurrence of it is Mark 4.11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. And I think it's here for a reason. Because remember, Jesus is speaking in parables. He speaks in parables to the crowd. The crowd's Jews. And they hear the parable, you know, the sower goeth out to sow, and some fell by the wayside, and this and that and the other, or 
A man went out and sowed a field, and then his, when he was asleep, his enemy came and sowed tares in among the wheat. And he tells all these stories, but then nobody understands them. Nobody gets the meaning of it. And then they probably make up their own or whatever. But then he sits with his disciples, and he says, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you the secret. I'm going to tell you the revel. I'm going to give you the revelation. But to them that are without, they'll never know. They'll never get it. And your friends and your family members who know you, they don't get it, do they? They don't understand. Well, why are you going all up to Missouri for? I've watched that guy. He's a nutcase, right? They don't understand. And we just pray that God would open their eyes. And the thing about this word mysteries, you've heard me. Every time the word mysteries in the Bible, he says, I'm going to tell you the mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. I would not that you be ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Even with Babylon, I will show you the mystery of the, of the uh, woman clothed in scarlet and the beast that carrieth her. I will tell you these things, God says. I will reveal the mystery to you so that when the next thing that's going to happen, I was telling my son this. I've told him, Matthew, stock up on some food. Get some water, put it away. Because I think between now and the election, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I don't think this world is done making our life worse. Do you? And we, we've got still, I thought by summer this COVID thing, because flu doesn't do well in summertime. Everybody knows that. And Antifa protesting night after night working feverishly to try to burn down the federal courthouse in Portland, Oregon, while the news media lying through their teeth, telling you it's a bunch of mothers, Sunday school teachers, out talking about how black lives matter. No, it's not. It's a bunch of communist rebels who are doing acts of sedition inside the United States of America, and they should be locked up in a federal prison somewhere. They should be. It's a crime. What they're doing is a federal crime. What are they going to do that's worse than what they're doing now? Because some names are going to be named with this Epstein deal. And some closets are going to be opened that those people don't want open. And they will do anything to stop what's coming. And those of us, and see, it scares people, it scares me. If I didn't have this Bible, I would have lost my mind or blown it out a long time ago. Something worse is going to happen. We know it biblically. But God will show us in his word what this is. So tomorrow, I am going to talk about divination but what if, Will, what if I stopped at your house on the way back from all those Amish farmers, smell like cow manure, and I said, Will, I saw into the future and I have the winning Ohio lottery ticket right here and I'm going to give it to you. $250 million, $250 million, Mama. $250 million. I don't see Will shaking his head no. I see his wife going, mm -mm. Will's going, mm. I pray about it. Now, here's what I want you to think of. We actually have a window into the future. And I'm going to win eternal riches. I said it. So you see the difference? I looked into a crystal ball and I got the winning lottery numbers and I stopped to give it to Will. 
And his wife said, I'm going to cut that in pieces. They ain't going nowhere. But then I offered him the book of life that's going to give him eternal riches forever. That's an easy one. I'll take that. Amen? Amen. That's what we have here. Amen. We have a window to the future. Amen?